great, what a great word to us. What a great, oh my goodness. Well, that's some wonderful theology there. I don't know if you know this, you're aware of it, but that is a fact right there. Fear and depression. <laughs> you know, you got to go. All lesser things that demand my, you got to go. You got you to bow down. I'm convinced that the number one reason why we don't live for Christ like we should and we don't follow the purpose of God in our life like he's leading us to follow it is just, is just one, one easy, simple reason, fear, fear. We're afraid we'll be ostracized. We're afraid, we're afraid we can't make it. We're afraid that people will leave us and that uh, you know, our life will be exposed as something that's not. I mean, it's just pure old-fashioned fear. And, and, and we let that fear prevent us from living the life that Christ has called us to live. Yeah, yeah. And that's really what the Beatitudes are all about, actually. The Beatitudes are all about conquering fear in our life because the enemy tries to tell us to be afraid of God and to be afraid of the purposes of God. It, 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 there's no way that you can live these. There's, there's no way you could fulfill these. And God, even if you could, God's not going to bless your life. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, let me tell you how to be blessed. Here's, here's, here, here are the eight things that will bring happiness into your life. Because the word blessed, remember, is, is the yeah. Greek word markyrios. And markyrios is translated just as easily translated, happy are you. The word blessed here uh, is, is a form of happiness. So you're going to be happy when you are a peacemaker, happy when you're merciful. Matter of fact, look, look at all the verses and the ones we've studied. There are seven things that we've looked at so far that are the attitudes that Jesus had. And Jesus said, all right, if you'll have the same attitude that I had while I was here on earth, then your life can be happy. And notice what he said, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he had seated, his disciples came to them, him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, here we go, blessed or happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you're poor in spirit, you recognize your need for the Lord. You're humble. And if you're a humble person and you recognize that you really need the Lord in your life, then you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not only one day when you sit with Jesus and everything's over and you are at the marriage supper of the Lamb and the kingdom is divided and you sit in heaven on the throne and you, you get your rewards and all of that, not only then when the kingdom of, of heaven is, comes to its uh, fruition, but the, where the kingdom of heaven is now, which is all around you. Uh, if we could see the spirit realm around us right now, what we would see is the kingdom of heaven all around our life. And the devil would be coming and the spirits would be coming and the, king, and the, the angels would be moving. And the Bible says that the heirs, the angels have been sent to, to, to protect the heirs of salvation the ones that are that are us that are going to are going to be taken by the lord because of our commitment to jesus christ but anyway the point is that's 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 going to make us happy if we live a life like this and then in verse 4 it says blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted if you mourn legitimate grief is what he's talking about not moan if you if you have legitimate grief god's going to come with strength in your life god can do something with truly legitimate strength not, not moaning, but mourning in life. Uh, God said, I can come with strength and do something. Blessed are the meek. Meek means your strength, your strength under control. You're strong. You're capable. Uh, you have a personality. You have a spirit. You have a drive within you. And you could blow people away. You could be overwhelming. You could be intimidating. You, 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 know, you could take control and you could just overwhelm situations. But the Lord said, no, you need to keep that strength of yours under control, especially when it comes to other people in life. It's really, it's really talking in this context here about how we deal with other people in our life. And if you can keep that strength of yours over, uh, under control, then you're going to be happy because God is going to work in your life and, and you're going to inherit the earth. In other words, he that's been faithful over a few things, I'm going to make him ruler over many. And anyway, it goes on with that. And then verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If I'm hungry for the right stuff, 
Righteousness just means right. If you want to, you know, if you want just a simple def definition, when you see the word righteousness, it means right. If I if I want to live right, if I'm if I'm hungry for the right things, if I want my life to be right, if I want to live right, if I'm hungry for that, and I'm not hungry for spiritual junk food, for things that are not uh, right, that have no value in heaven. All of these counterfeit things and false things and things that people encourage me to be for in the Christian life and I have some phony counterfeit kind of junk I'm living for in the kingdom. He said, if you live so that your life can be right and reflect me, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be happy because I can feel you if that's what you're hungry for. <laughs> if you're hungry for junk, I don't have any junk. You, you got... I, I'm not going to be able to feel you, but if you're hungry for right stuff, hey, you're happy because I can fill you with good stuff. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you give mercy, you're going to get mercy. If you don't give mercy, you're not going to get mercy. And this is a real vital principle of the kingdom of God. You know, it's the law of direct uh, return. The law of direct return says you uh, get what you give. <laughs> Yeah, uh, law of sowing and reaping. What you reap, you sow. What you sow, you reap. It's a dynamic principle of God. And then verse eight: Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart means my motives are not mixed up. I'm the same on the inside as I am on the outside. I, I have pure motives. I'm not saying one thing and doing something else. I'm not a hypocrite. In other words. My, my, I, when I say things, that reflects the real direction of my life. I'm not counterfeit. I'm not trying to, trying to be one person with this group and another person with this group. And so he says to us, if you're a person with unmixed motives, that, that you're going to be able to see God work in your life. And I'm going to tell you something. If you ever see God work in your life, if you've ever had God work in your life, and you knew it was God. Something happened in your life, and you looked at that, and you said, man, that could not be anything but God. If that has ever happened to you, you have never forgotten it, have you? I guarantee you, 50 years from now, somebody had a testimony service and said, would anybody like to share a, a testimony of how God ever worked in your life? You'd jump up, and it, you'd be just as excited about it 50 years from now. Every detail would come alive because it would be, it's just burning to your spirit because you never forget seeing God work in your life. Some of you right now are hungering for God to work in your life. You, you, you're saying, God, if you could just work in my life, it would just encourage me and I could see the value of Christianity and I could be impressed by everything. And God, I need you to work in my life. Well, he says, here's how you do it. Uh, get, get, make sure your motives are right. Let's get pure in our motives and then you're going to be able to look around in your life and you're going to be able to see me working in your life. You can be happy because that's what I'm going to do in your life with un, people that were unmixed motives. And then last week we looked at blessed are the peacemakers for they should be called the children of God, not the peace lovers. We all love peace, not the peace wanters. We all want peace. He said blessed are the peacemakers, those makers. That means people who actively, actively seek peace. You got to make peace, all right? Peace doesn't just come. Peace doesn't happen by accident. We live in a world of confusion and a world of, 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 of hostility and a world of wrath, a world uh, contrary to the kingdom of God and, and the devil ro roams on this earth roaring back and forth ro ro like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. So there's always conflict. There's always a battle, an enemy so Jesus said, all right, you want to you you li you live with an attitude like the attitude I have so you can be happy? Uh, look for conflict and make peace there. If you're out with somebody, you actively seek to make peace. And if you do this, if you live like this, now it doesn't mean that you always can. And Jesus is a realist now, so Jesus is not... 
telling us that we're going to be able to change everything or change everybody. You remember? He said, as much as in you is. <laughs> That's the old King James translation. As much as in you is, live at peace with all. In other words, there, there's some people that are not going to let you live at peace with them. Some people, you, you can't live peaceably with all people because they're not going to let you live peaceably with them. But as much as it depends on you, you don't lock the door on your side. You, you keep your side open and look for opportunities to make peace and live peaceably with all men. And, and, and people will see God in you because you'll look like God. <laughs> you look like your parents. I, I know that's kind of sad to somebody, some people. Yeah, the genetics that are in you. And I don't even know where they came from, but all I can tell you is you have some things that look like your mom and some things that look like your dad. And everybody in here had a mom and a dad. Whether you know who it is or not, you had a dad. You have a mom, and those genetics blended to make you, to make what looks back at you when you look in the mirror is a blend of genetics and all of that, DNA and all of that, that went together to make you. So, if you want to look like your heavenly father, then he said, be a peacemaker. And you can look like me. Whenever people look at you, they'll say, man, you're like, you're like Jesus. You're like God, man. What in the world? Who could do that? That's a God thing. And then he comes with this last one. This is the last beatitude. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness and say, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We'll look at that just a little bit. Later, I want to deal with a couple of misconceptions before we actually get into the verse. Uh, uh, one of the, 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 the misconceptions um, about happiness is that, that um, happiness, happiness, happiness ca can't be found. We live unhappily because uh, we, we, we need to try to be like everyone else. In order to be happy, we need to be like everyone else. We, we can be like them, and then we can make them happy, and then we're not in conflict with them, and we can live that way. And boy, that, so, so that's what it means to, to live happy on this earth, is to make everyone like us because we're just like them. Uh, don't, don't try to cause conflict. Just go that way and live like they do, and then we can be happy because the second misconception is, in order to be happy myself, everybody else has to like me. I mean, in order to be happy, I've got to be approved by everyone. Now, let me ask you, does that work? No. Why, 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 wouldn't, that, why wouldn't that work? That's exactly it, right. <laughs> because you can't make everybody else happy, right? I mean, just when you get one, please, about half a dozen pop out the saddle with you. And so Jesus was a realist, and Jesus, you know, was very honest with us. Jesus said, let me, let me, let me tell you what. If you live like I'm, I'm, like I'm telling you to live in these other seven Beatitudes that have come before, if you live those other seven at attitudes that, that have been listed and you follow me, there, there are going to be some, there are gonna be some, some, some that, that disapprove of your choices that you have made in life. And according to verse number 10, you're going to get persecuted. If you live the other seven, those things I just talked about, Jesus said, expect persecution to come in your life. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And of course, uh, that is so uh, shocking that Jesus repeats that in the next couple of verses. He said, blessed are you when they revile you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. So Jesus is saying, notice two things about this beatitude. Number one, Jesus speaks more in this beatitude than any of the other beatitudes. The others are basically one line. Blessed are you when you make peace and you'll be called the 
sons of God. Blessed are you who are merciful, for you shall obtain mercy. And he talks about it in just a general personality of Christian, and he says one line about it, and basically you do this and you get this. This one has three lines about it, and he just kind of expands it, and he talks about it more than any of the others. So it's, it's a little bit longer, and it's a little bit uh, broader, and Jesus describes it a little bit better. And then also notice that he personalizes it. All the other are just a general statement that would fit the personality of a Christian. Blessed are you when blah, blah. Blessed are you and you shall be called. And, and it's just a general uh, personality of Christ kind of a statement. But notice in here, he gets personal. In verse 11, blessed are you <laughs> Hell, when they revile you and persecute you and say all manners of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. And so he gets real personal about this. And the point is really that this is, this is what sums up the attitude of the world and how it's going to respond when a Christian person lives out these first seven Beatitudes. In other words, this beatitude, Jesus is saying basically this. Happy are those who can handle rejection. Because if you live like I'm telling you to live and these other seven that have come before, you know what you're going to face? You're going to face a world that rejects you. A world that's not going to honor you. A world that looks at you as some strange creature. You're not going to fit into most categories of life. You're going, to be, you know, you're going to be a thorn in the flesh of the world. And they're not going to want you, and they're not going to want to be with you. So today, what we're going to look at is how to respond to that type of harassment. But before we do, let, let's just look here at this verse for just a moment and, and look at the reality of, of, our, of, the, of harassment in our life. Look at verse 11, first part of the verse. Blessed are you when they shall, when they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Notice that it doesn't say if you're persecuted. Like it doesn't say blessed are you if you are persecuted. No if, no if, no if. <laughs> it says what? Blessed are you when you are persecuted, which basically says to us, you are going to be persecuted, right? So he says, look, uh, uh, don't be naive about this. Don't, don't be caught off guard about this. Uh, uh, as the world becomes more and more secular, uh, it becomes more and more hostile to Christianity. Now, is, is this what we are experiencing today? As our world becomes more and more secular, when the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, becomes more like all of the rest of the nations of the earth and becomes more secular, it becomes more and more an enemy of the kingdom of God. I mean, just look at our life. We talk about it in terms of family values, but those family values came from Christ, came from the word of God, came from the commandments of God. And now those are looked down their, their nose in disdain. And anybody that would claim some type of morality and some type of reason for living this kind of valued lifestyle, man, they're looked at as the enemy. They're not politically correct. You know, they're antisocial. They are looked at as some strange and crazy being. And that which should be put down is lifted up, and that which is, should be honored is, is, is put down. We live in a backward, crazy, kind of upside-down world. Well, Jesus was a realist, and he said, Look, guys, I'm telling you, if this is how you're going to live, you need to get ready to be persecuted because they're going to persecute you, and the world is not going to honor you, so don't be caught off guard as the world becomes more like this, this is what's going to happen. So we can expect, what can we expect from here? I'm going to tell you, you can expect it to get worse. <laughs> I'm not a pessimist, really. I'm, I'm a glass is half full kind of person. You know that. I believe you know that, right? I mean, I hate to even say stuff like that. 
But what, what I, I mean, I'm 60, almost 64 years old, and I can tell you, in my little brief lifetime, boy, I mean, it's a snowball rolling downhill. Fast, I'm talking about too fast, things are changing. And it's, and, it, and it's because of the world becoming more and more secular. And, and there may be lots of reasons why we get persecuted. I mean, it might be uh, 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 hypocrisy or intolerance or, or intimid- we, because we intimidate people or we have this air of superiority. I mean, I mean there, there could be a lot of reasons we could point to and say, mm, that's why the world doesn't like us. So, but uh, to me, those are all smoke screens. Really, uh, there's, it, it all boils down to one primary reason why they hate us and they don't like us, and it's the last part of verse 11. What does the last part of verse 7, 11 say? Uh, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Uh, wh- why? Uh, Jesus said, for my sake. For my sake. So uh, it's not talking about uh, racial harassment. It's not talking about sexual uh, uh, harassment. It's not, not talking about gender bias. It not, it's not talking about we're getting put down because we're obnoxious jerks. You know, Jesus said, you're, you're, getting, you're getting put down because of me. It's because of your relationship with me. So this is not talking about people who try to martyr them. Have you ever been around a Christian who tries to become a martyr and their attitude is like somehow uh, they're, they're being persecuted because they're uh, such a, you know, they're just a Christian and they, you know, they just, oh, they're, the people just hate Christians and they set themselves up as a, as a martyr for Christ and then they want to say that's why they're being persecuted. Now, now they're irritating, they're stubborn, they're loud and they're nosy and they, you know, they have that superior attitude and they have that attitude of uh, uh, they're better than everybody else and people are evil and, they, and, and, they, and, and, and they're just purely obnoxious. You know, well, that's the way they live their Christianity, but then they want to claim, well, I'm being persecuted for Christ. No, you're being persecuted because you're a jerk. Right? I mean, I don't blame you. I don't like you either, you know. <laughs> So it's not talking about that, and it's not talking about these uh, self-righteous Christians who witness to everybody else with some kind of attitude of superior, superiority and always putting people down, turn or burn, die and fry, get right or get left. I'm so good and you're so bad, and God has sent me to tell you all of your sins and all of your wicked ways. And when you talk to somebody about Christ, it's basically... Let me tell you why you're so bad and I'm so good and you need to come and be like me and then you can be like Christ. And when they get rejected, they want to come back and say, I'm being persecuted because I'm, I'm like Jesus. No, you're being persecuted because you're a jerk. People don't like people like you. So he's saying here, you're not getting rejected because of those kinds of things. You're getting rejected because you are real, because you, you, you are like Christ. And the explanation that Jesus makes about this is in John 15, and I'll just quote it. And you, Many of you know this verse also by heart. Jesus said, no servant is better than his master. What's the next line? Because they hated me, they're going to hate you, Right? So the right reason to be persecuted, according to Jesus, the right reason to be persecuted is for being like him, (laughs) right? So evil people don't like Jesus. Why don't evil people like Jesus? Because Jesus exposes them. But evil people don't attack Jesus personally. They can't get to Jesus personally. So what do they do? They do the next best thing. They attack his children, right? And notice how the media, and I know the media gets blamed for everything, but there's a good reason for that. But the media is is just merciless against Christians, right? Man, you let a Christian mess up or somebody that calls themselves a Christian. And it'll be, on every, it'll be on every headline. It'll be, 
It'll be everywhere. It'll go viral in just a few minutes. Why? Well, because people love to see hypocrisy because it makes them feel better about themselves. I mean, what, what they've chosen is they've chosen not to live righteous. They've chosen not to live with Christ. And, and, and of course, the Holy Spirit is convicting that. But when they have somebody that is a hypocrite and messes up in life, then they can look at that and then they can say, well, I told you I was right. So it just reinforces the fact that they think all of this stuff that we live and preach and say is just a bunch of phony mess anyway. So it just enhances their unbelief. Remember, it was the religious world that crucified Jesus. You know why they did it? Because they didn't feel comfortable around Jesus. So the more like Jesus you become, the more isolated you're going to become from the world. Darkness doesn't love light because, because light exposes darkness. And the more positive you are in life, the more negative people are going to hate you. Because you ruffle, you, 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 you ruffle their little pessimistic narrow nest. Paul told Timothy... Everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus shall be, not probably will be, not might be, but if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall be persecuted. The world has a hard time accepting, accepting someone who's different. Jesus did not fit into the mold of the world, and if you're like him, neither are you. Six suggestions. I'm going to hit them real quick. All right. Six suggestions on how to handle being harassed for your stand for Jesus. You're going to choose to live like this beatitude says you need to live? I mean, are you going to buy into this? Is this the way you're going to live your life? And those seven others that have come before, then let me give you six suggestions on how to handle being harassed for your faith because you are going to be harassed. If you live out any of those others and this one, it's going to be... Uh, you're going gonna, you're gonna to face this at times, persecution and harassment and so forth. All right, number one, recognize the source. If I'm going to live like this, the first thing I have to do is I have to recognize the source. The source of this persecution. Where is this persecution coming from? All right, here's what Paul says in Ephesians 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in the high places. So uh, who, this verse says the child of God is the enemy of whom? Is that right, Tan, my English major? Is the enemy of whom? Uh, I, I'm, I'm a child of God. Who is my enemy? Uh, is it my next door neighbor? Is that, is that my enemy? That's who I fight against? Or is it the mayor or the city council? Or who is it that is my enemy? What is the source of my, of my uh, uh, persecution in life? Well, it's, uh, it's the devil is who it is. Flip Wilson was right. And those of you that don't know Flip, it's because you're not old enough. Yeah, Geraldine, you remember the old character? The devil made me do it. Well, that's the truth. The devil is our enemy. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. It's ruler of darkness. So, I, you know, I, I have to recognize that my fight is not against flesh and blood. My enemy is not some other person. My enemy is a spiritual person. So the enemy is my devil. Is the devil? Let me ask you something, parents. You see this all the time. What is the best way to hurt you? Well, well, let me ask it this way. Would it be easier to hurt you by hurting you personally or by hurting one of your children? Which would be the quickest and easiest? It'd be, it'd be easier. A lot of things you could do to me, and I'm okay. I mean, I don't like it, but it's not overwhelming. But all of a sudden, you begin to hurt my child. And man, it gets real personal real quick, doesn't it? I mean, it gets, it gets time for some action <laughs> real, real quick. Because that's just a part of our heart that we don't want you touching that. Well, see, the devil can't get to God. The devil can't compete with God. I know that many people don't know this, but let me just say to you real quickly, the, the devil is not the opposite of God. 
The devil is not the enemy of God because the devil is not equal to God. In other, in other words, to be an enemy, we have to be equal. The devil is not equal to God. The devil is not in God's zip code. The devil is a created being. God created him. His choices cre were to change him. But he was an angel. He was created. So he's a created being. God is eternal. God's always existed. That's what eternal means. And he will always exist. The devil did not exist at some time, but God created him. And, God, and the devil does not have all power. He cannot be powerful over anything of God. God is all powerful. God can do anything. And the devil can only be one place at one time. God can be everywhere all at once. And so the, the devil is not equal to God. The, the devil is an enemy of God. He is not, he's not God's enemy because he can't be overpowered. He can't overpower God. So in other words, God can't, the, the devil can't do anything against God. So what's the devil going to have to fight against? Something that God loves, right? Which is us. So Revelation chapter 12 tells us that, that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. In other words, the, the devil stands before the throne of God and accuses us night and day to God. Look at that, God. I thought they loved you. Look at that, God. Oh, I thought they were going to serve you. Look at that, God. What a hypocrite. Oh, my Lord. I don't know how you could love them anymore because they said they would never do that. And look at, that's exactly what they did. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would, man, that one wouldn't make it if it was up to me because I'm telling you that one right there does that kind of stuff all the time. And you know it because you know everything about them and you see everything about them. That's the devil, day and night, accusing you before God. He is your enemy, the enemy of your soul. So it, it's not that person at work. The enemy would love to convince you, you need to fight against her because she doesn't like you. Well, no, she's a pawn of the enemy. She doesn't know she's being used, but she's being used by the enemy. So if you want to come against something, don't, don't, don't come against her. Come against the, the, the spirit that, that is pushing her in life. Good night, man. For we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and rulers of the darkness. So get in the right battlefield. If you're fighting against them, the devil's standing over there in the corner going, <laughs> boy, they're not even in this right battlefield. Even if you were successful, they wouldn't, you wouldn't be successful. So the real problem is let's, let's, let's battle against the real enemy. So, all right, one of, one of the resources to handle harassment for my faith is I've got to, I've got to, go, I've got to know the source. All right, here is the second one. Here's the second suggestion to you about how to live through harassment. Refuse to retaliate. Now, I'm not saying any of these are easy, all right? I didn't say here are six easy ways to make it through. No, they're not easy. They get worse, by the way. Each one gets deeper and deeper. All right, I got to get with the first one. Now, here's the second one. I've got to refuse to retaliate. Whoa, I know that's so easy to say, but you might say, well, Pastor, you can just stop right there because I'm not, you know, <laughs> that, that, that one right there, I'm not going to do that, you know, because my natural reaction is when somebody hurts me, whoo, hurt them back, baby. I mean, make them suffer, baby. Look at what Jesus, or what the Apostle Paul had to say. Oh, uh, this is just one of the things. This is, there's many of this, but look at Romans 12. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. There's that, if it, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. There's that verse. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. In other words, wrath has a place to be. So wrath, the place for wrath is not on you. The place for wrath is to give it to God. Let God hold your wrath is what he's basically saying. Give wrath a place with God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So don't take vengeance. 
That person who's harassing you, that person who's being evil to you, they don't realize it, but they're just a pawn of the enemy being used by the devil. So here's back to Matthew 5. See what he says. Blessed are you when they... Uh, they're going to be. They're going to basically be three types of verbal harassment people are going to come against you with, and the three types of verbal harassment are blessed when they shall revile you. What is to revile someone? Well, when I revile someone, it means I insult you. It mean it, it, it means I put you down. I I, uh, I I dishonor you. I disrespect you. I discredit you. I revile you. I can get ready for it. And then he said the, uh, another way they can put you down is uh, persecution. Blessed are those who revile you and persecute you. What does that mean? It means people who mistreat you. People who are harsh and bitter and angry and hostile. And they, whew, they not only put you down and dishonor you, but they mistreat you. Ooh, that's just another step. And then the last one is people who lie about you, who say false things about you. Have you ever had anybody lie on you? Have you, everybody, have you ever had anybody just flat out lie? Yeah. Deceit and deception against you. Put you down. Persecute you. Revile you. Disrespect you. And then just flat-footed lie about you? Yeah. Well, Jesus said, when this happens, refuse to retaliate. <laughs> the, love, the world loves to find fault with you, right? The world just nitpicks to find fault with you. Be why? Because you're a Christian. <laughs> we, find, we see it every day, right? I mean, what makes the news? If a, pa if a pastor stole money from his church and ran off with a church pianist, would that be on the news? Oh, yeah. It'd be on every station. It'd be one of those Chiron graphics running across the bottom of the screen. Pastor in Mississippi steals all church money and runs off with a pianist. Well, I got news for you. I go home with a pianist every day. So there, you <laughs> there you go. How scandalous is that? And I take, take all the church money home with me too, you know. Yeah, I can open the account. So, but, but you get what I'm saying. If, if that happened, it would be top news. But what about if uh, Gene the Barber up here did it? Uh, would, would that be said? Anything should be? No, um, who cares what the barber did? But, you know, uh, yeah, Gene, you know, this is money anyway. So, yeah. No. I, I'm just saying that the world looks for an opportunity to be critical about Christians and to and to put Christians down and to revile and persecute them and all of that kind of stuff. And if it can't find something that's real, <laughs> well, let's just make it up. Yeah, let's just, let's just speculate. But do you, know, do you know they did that with Jesus? Same thing they did with Jesus? Let me let you look at these verses. This is in Matthew 11. For John came, now that's John the Baptist, okay? So when John the Baptist came, he didn't come eating or drinking. He wouldn't sit down at the community picnic and eat with the people. He wouldn't drink. He, when they had a wedding or whatever and they started serving the wine or, or whatever they were serving, John would say, no, don't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not celebrating with you and I'm not eating with you and I'm not drinking with you. And they said, what are you, a, full of demons or something? They accused him of having a demon. John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he has a demon. The Son of Man, everybody say Jesus. Jesus, Jesus came both eating and drinking. Jesus sat down and ate supper with them, man. Jesus sat down and, and partied at the wedding with them, and eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by our children. That's kind of a little funny phrase in the, in the King James type way of saying it. But wisdom is justified. The children of wisdom are the works that are born to being wise. So that tells you. Uh, wisdom is justified by its works. You know, uh, the children of, wor of wisdom are how it looks, how it presents itself, what's born out of it. 
But you see what I mean here? Uh, Jesus was called what? A, a glutton and a wine bibber and a tax collector? I mean, yeah. But, but Jesus never reviled back. Jesus refused to retaliate, right? What, what, how do we know? That? What did he say on the cross? The, the, what was, the, what was the, uh, almost the last thing that he said, Father, what? Father, get them back. Father, hit them with a lightning bolt. God, turn them into crispy critters. That's what they deserve. No, he said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing, God. God, don't turn them into a crispy critter. Don't give a, hit them with a lightning bolt. Because they don't know what they're doing. So when they reviled him, he did not revile back. So if you're going to handle harassment and be happy, you've got to know where it comes from, and then you've got to refuse to allow the enemy to push you to retaliate against somebody that's just a pawn in the whole situation. And how do I pray about it? I pray about the real spirit of the real enemy that's bringing this. Let me give you a third way, a third uh, uh, concept here. Respond positively. You not only don't revile, but you respond in a positive way. This comes from the book of Romans chapter 12. It said, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. What? Do not be evil. But, uh, but, <laughs> but overcome evil with good. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Is that how I normal, normally respond to things? Somebody harassing me? You know, somebody coming against me? Somebody being ugly to me? Is, is when they say bad stuff, I do good stuff for them? Is that normal? No. My normal reaction is, um, I'm going to get that guy. All right. That's right. Oh, I'm going to get him, and I'm going to tell you what, I, oh, it's going to be so bad, I'll tell them a thing or two. Boy, I'm telling you, they can't do that to me. So we often try to get ahead by getting even with somebody. You know, one thing I've learned, I, I know that many of you know, already know this, that I'm, uh, I, I came from a family of four children, with four children, and I'm the oldest of the four. And uh, there's one thing I learned growing up with two sisters and a brother. I could get to them. I knew just the buttons to push. I knew just the way to get to them. And here's what I learned. As long as I could push the right buttons, I could get them to respond in certain ways. And I could begin to predict the ways that they would respond to my uh, aggression in all the right buttons. And here's what I know. I knew that when I could get them to respond the way I wanted them to, and get out of control and out of whack that I was in charge. I had them because I could make them do whatever I wanted them to do. So Jesus is saying, look, don't let the devil push your buttons because if he can goad you into reacting a certain way, he's got you. And you're going to respond in all the wrong ways. So how are you going to positively react when somebody treats you wrong? Matthew chapter 5, just a couple of verses in the middle of about three or four, but what it says, but I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, the verses before and after, I'll just tell you what the context is. Before and after this, he said... Uh, don't just love people that love you. Because if you just love people that love you, uh, where's the grace? Right, basically. I mean, if, you love, if you love people that love you, the heathens do that. Sinners do that. People that don't even have the Holy Spirit in their life or me, they love people that love them. Where's the grace in that? And if you do good to people that do good to you, where's the grace in that? And if you lend money to those that can pay you back, what's the, where's the grace to that? I'm telling you, love people who don't love you. That's how it shows up that you're one of my children. 
Whoo, it does too. Pray for people who persecute you and, and the people that are trying to hurt you. Is that easy? No, that is not easy. Do you normally do that? No, you don't normally do it. That's why God had to tell you that. Because you don't normally do it and you will not do it unless you believe that God means what he says. Is that what God says? <laughs> well, yeah, that's exactly what God said. Will it work? Well, yes, it will work. He said it. So don't react negatively. Don't react at all. Respond positively. Build them up. When they put you down, you build them up. Woo! Boy, that is a difficult thing to do. So you can't, you can't control things by, respond, by repaying evil for evil. You, you have to repay evil with good. Oh, that's a very difficult thing, right? You have to be full of God to do it, okay? Well, if you have to be full of God to do that one, this next one, you're going to have, really have to be full of God to do. A lot of people stumble over this next one. I mean, if you, they stumble over these first three, but they really stumble over this next one. But you don't stumble over it. Jesus said, uh, do it. And here's what he said, uh, rejoice over it. <laughs> don't stumble over it. Rejoice over it. Rejoice when somebody is going to persecute me. Rejoice and get all pumped up about uh, somebody treating me bad. Well, look, look at what it says in, in verse 11. Happy are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets that were before you. Now you look at that and you say, what? What do what you want me to do? What, Jesus? You want me to do what? Are you kidding me, Jesus? Is that that's some kind of joke? I mean, there's another verse that says, do not pay attention to Matthew uh, 12, uh, 5, verse 12, because that's not really uh, uh, realistic in life. No, no, no. What, what is Jesus, some kind of masochist or something? I mean, it hurt me, hurt me. <laughs> no, no. Um, what's the context of, of what Jesus is saying? He's saying, you're being persecuted because you're like Jesus. You're not persecuted for being obnoxious and, 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 a, and, a, and a, uh, a jerk and, 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 and a hypocrite. You're being persecuted because you're like Jesus. And he says, so Jesus is saying, look, when you're being persecuted for being like me, don't complain, celebrate. Why in the world should I celebrate and rejoice when people are, are, are put me down? Three good reasons. Number one reason, it means that God's spirit can be seen in my life. <laughs> if God's spirit couldn't be seen in my life, why would they be harassing me? So the reason they're harassing me is because they can see God's spirit in my life. So I can, re I can be happy when somebody puts me down for being like Jesus because it shows that, my, that Jesus' spirit is being seen in my life. Celebrate over that. That's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If you're reproached for the name of, of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed. Blaspheme means to uh, basically uh, treat something with irreverence, to, 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 be, to be put something down, to be uh, disrespectful in, in, in giving it the honor it deserves. So when people do that, they're dishonoring God in an evil spirit, but on your part, he's glorified. So basically what he's saying is, look, when, when somebody uh, persecutes you because they see Jesus in you, that is, that's what, the reason they do that is because they see Jesus. And, and, and if you get harassed a little for somebody seeing Jesus in you, that is an honorable thing. And if you don't get harassed a little bit, you ought to ask yourself the question, uh, uh, 
But is Jesus really in there? I mean, hey, look, if you turn a light on in a dark room, shouldn't you be able to tell? Huh? I mean, I mean, do the people you work with know that you're a Christian? Do the people you go to school, do they know it? Would they be surprised if they found out? <laughs> They're like, what? He's a Christian? Are you kidding me? I mean, if I went in there and I told them you were, I, I was your pastor, how would they respond to me? <laughs> would they give me the old, uh, ooh, roll, eye roll? I mean, yeah. And I would have never guessed they went to church. <laughs> yeah, so you can be happy if you're persecuted for Jesus' sake because at least it shows that the Spirit of God is in your life. Here's a second thing. It means that God can trust me. I can be happy because it, God, I, it shows God's Spirit in my life, which is what I want to show, and I can be happy because it shows that God can trust me. This may sound strange, but the Bible says that harassment or, in living a godly life is a worthy thing. That's worthy. Acts chapter 5, look at this. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. When I suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus, that is a worthy thing. And the disciples said, bless God, God trusts us enough to, to, to know that we're going to suffer for him and we're not going to knuckle under and give in to somebody trying to put pressure on us. That is a worthy thing, man. That is a, that is a, that is a trusting thing from God. You know, we in America, we don't know what it's like to be persecuted. People are persecuted. People are persecuted all over this world. I'll guarantee you that in 2019... Thousands of people have been killed every day for Jesus around this world. We, we think we're persecuted if somebody makes a joke about us. If somebody just points us out and kind of giggles, that, that's what we think persecution is. They're being martyred all over this world because they know Jesus. And, 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 and we're... We're, we think we're being persecuted when the least little thing happens. We don't know anything about persecution. We have it so easy. Yeah, and, 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 we, and then, we, here's what, we pray and we thank God that we're not being persecuted, right? I've heard it. I, I've said it in my own prayer life sometimes. God, I thank you that we live in a land and a country where we're not being killed and persecuted, that we have the freedom to come in here and worship you and not have to be intimidated or fearful about it. We, and we consider that a blessing. And I'm just saying to you that, that is that really a blessing? I mean, it, 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 no persecution, no, uh, no opportunity to stand for Christ when my life is on the line. Because when I stand for Christ like that, I grow in my spirit. It pushes me toward immediate maturity. The Bible says that they were considered worthy to suffer for Christ. But suffering for him is something that we ought to rejoice in because it means that God thinks you can handle it. So if you don't have any persecution in your life, can God trust you? If you do suffer for Christ, it means God thinks you can handle it. And God allows it to come because he can trust you. So I can rejoice over it because it means God's Spirit's seen in me. I can rejoice over it because it means God can trust me. And then this last little, little one right here, I can rejoice because it's only temporary. Uh, yeah, uh, it's only temporary. The point is that all of these things that God says about the things that, are, that come against us are just momentary things. Look, look, look at 2 Corinthians 14. This is uh, uh, Paul's talking, and he says to the Corinthians, for our light affliction, sometimes our affliction doesn't seem light, does it? It seems heavy. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, doesn't seem like it's only for a moment either, does it? It seems like, boy, it's been lasting for years. 
our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our, our suffering is doing something for us. While we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen is eternal. Now, I don't want to get too deeply involved in this, but basically what he's saying is our perspective has to change. The way we see things have to change. Let me just show what I'm talking about. Do you see this right here? This is like a stand. It's physical, right? We can see it. It's standing right here. He's saying this is something that can be seen. When I say God is all around you, the Holy Spirit is in this room, uh, do you see him? And you begin to look around like this, and you say, no, I don't see him. So he's unseen. This is seen. He's unseen. Which one is more real? Well, this says God is more real. And you know why? Because which one's going to last forever? <laughs> yeah, this, this lasts only a limited amount of time, and then it's gone. So the unseen is more real than the seen because the unseen lasts forever, and the real is only temporary in life. So our eternal perspective will change the way we look at cars and businesses and houses and, you know, um, uh, devices and cell phones and all of that kind of stuff. Because what our, what's going to last about our life is not all the gizmos we have, but how we live for God in this life right now because it's storing up something. I'll talk about that in just a second. But, 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 the, what he's saying here, my favorite verse, this may be your favorite verse too, and it came to pass. That's my favorite. He said, Pastor, what's your favorite verse? And it came to pass. Or it's cousin, this too will pass. What is, say, what is it saying? It's saying trouble didn't come to stay, trouble came to pass, right? And thank God for that, right? Trouble didn't come to stay, it came. And, and see, that's an eternal perspective of life. So if you're going to rejoice over tough stuff coming into your life, you'll, you'll have to look at it with a different perspective. And you'll have to say, it honors God. It means God can be seen in my life, which is a great thing. It's great to know he's there. And then he trusts me or else he wouldn't allow this to come upon me. And then I got to remember, this isn't going to last forever. It's not going to always be like this. So got to got to have that perspective. Here is the fifth way, fifth attitude you have to have. Let me just say this quickly. Remember your reward. Remember that there is a, a reward in this. Uh, back, to, back to Matthew. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Look, for great is your reward in heaven. So there are obviously some special honors in heaven for people who suffer this persecution, right? In the first place, Jesus says, you're in good company, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you're in good company. You mean I, I, I'm like Isaiah? I, I'm like Jeremiah? I'm like Ezekiel? I'm like, I'm like Daniel? Yeah, well, yeah. Rejoice. Be happy about what's going on with your persecution because you're in good company. They treated the prophets just like that. They treated Jesus like that. And secondly, evidently, there are some degrees of reward in heaven because he says, great is your reward which identifies what? That there has to be some kind of degrees of reward or you can't have great. And then, you know, I mean, what, what would it be greater than if there weren't a level of rewards in heaven? The Bible says that there are five crowns that you get in heaven. The crown of, uh, uh, the crown, the incorruptible crown for people who, who have their body under control and live a holy life. How many of you, and don't answer out loud, but just uh, rhetorical. How many of you are going to get the crown, uh, the incorruptible crown? You've kept your body under control, right? Ooh, I just don't answer that out loud. The crown of rejoicing are for people who win people to Christ, who, you know, who go out and, and win. Okay, the crown of righteousness is the crown for people that live right and are holy living in their life. 
The crown of glory is the crown for faithfully teaching the Word of God and, and leading people in the Word of God and shepherding people. The crown of life is the martyr's crown for people who've given their life for Christ. Uh, you, you get any of those? <laughs> you, great is your reward in heaven? Yeah. And one of the ways to store up rewards is by responding like Jesus when we are hassled and criticized for our faith. So, I think I have that Romans 8 on here. I do, yeah. And since we are his children, we will share his treasures for everything God gives to his son, Christ, is ours too. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. So, if we get the goods, we got to go through the bad with Christ. So, remember your reward. So right now, uh, all these five, let me just hit them real quick. You, you, you recognize your source. It's the devil, not that person in the spiritual battle. You refuse to retaliate. You respond positively. You love them and pray for them. You rejoice over it because God's spirit can be seen in you. He can trust you, and it's only temporary. And then the reward is going to far outweigh anything that you've had to endure. And then one other, just real quick, here it is, remain faithful. Remain faithful. How do I handle How do I handle? Hassling for my faith. Those remain, last one, remain faithful. In, in 1 Peter, let me just read, I thought I had it up there. 1 Peter 4, 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer. Man, I, read, I really need to have this verse up there for you. You just have to trust me. But because it's going to say something radical. The ver, this verse is going to say something radical now. So listen to it. And, uh, wherefore, let them that suffer comma, according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their soul to him in well-doing, comma, as unto a faithful creator. Let me, let me just say that one more time, and I'm, I'm quitting, I promise. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. That's not what we hear about our life with God, is it? Gab it and grab it, name it and claim it, rip it and grip it, whatever. Assign your blessings. You know, do good things and you can assign the reward to anything you want. You know, I've heard that. And I, I don't have, I mean, that, that I, I believe in sowing and reaping, don't get me wrong, and I'm going to be teaching about that in the very, very near future. It's a great, it's the, mo one, it's the most dynamic principle, I think, in the whole Word of God. Sowing and reaping, I believe in that totally, but I've heard people teach quite often that you could sow certain seed and then assign a, where the crop comes up. Like, I'm going to sow some seed over here uh, like corn, and then I'm not going to reap corn. I'm going to reap whatever I want. Uh, uh, God, I want my corn not to be corn. I want it to be cotton candy, and I don't want it to come up over there. I want it to come up over here. What? Yeah, that, that, there's your good. There's your question right there. Yeah, there. But so that that we suffer according to the will of God is not what we normally hear about the Christian life. What we hear about the Christian life is if we serve him, we're not going to suffer. If we serve him, we get what we want. If we serve him, he's going to keep all that tough stuff away from us. But this verse says that we can suffer according to the will of God. That God's will is that sometimes we suffer. Whoo! Now you gotta you gotta believe that. You gotta know, okay, this suffering that I'm going through right here, is this according to the will of God? I mean, has God has God has God purposed this suffering to come against my life for some reason? Does God want to use me to show this world 
what it's like to trust him in spite of the fact that things are really tough in my life? Does God want to use this to impress my children, to show them that mom and dad are real and they're not, they're not hypocrites and they're legit and that Jesus really does mean something in life? Uh, you know, is God trying to uh, prove a point through me? <laughs> Am I like Job where I'm being used as an instrument so that God can prove himself mighty against a weak enemy like the devil? I mean, when I suffer according to the will of God, whoo, I'm telling you, if I pray <laughs> to come out of something that's the will of God, you ain't coming out. <laughs> if it's his will, it's his will. I'm just saying that remaining faithful is necessary. Because if I only remain faithful when I get what I ask for, I might not get this. Because it might be his will. Mm. So, there you go. That's just some suggestions in handling harassment. How can I be happy in spite of the fact that I'm persecuted and reviled and lied about? And all? I've got six... Six hassle handlers here, <laughs> you know, yeah. my perspective, my, my thoughts, and the way I live, and the way I, per, my perspective about things, and, and the fact that uh, I, I understand some things that God might be doing this for some reason and allowing this to happen for some reason, and, and, and I remain faithful, and whatever God chooses to do with me, through me, to me, about me, or whatever, uh, he's God and I'm not. And I belong to him. That's what salvation is all about, really, guys. Seriously. You know what salvation is? I give myself to you, God. So whatever you want to do with me, it's okay. I mean, we give God permission. We say, you're Lord. What does Lord mean? Lord means master. It means boss. That I would confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord is what the book of Romans says. If I confess with my mouth, this is Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says... If thou, and I'm, that's the King James, you can tell what, how I memorize things. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, is exactly what it says. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Two things. I got to confess that he is Lord. Confess comes from homo legeo, or English, con and fess. Con means similar or alike. Fess means to speak or to say. I've got to say the same thing God says. It's what it's saying, that Jesus is Lord. To confess means to speak the same as. As who? As God who says Jesus is Lord. So that means, okay, you're Lord. It mean, so that means you can decide what you want to do with my life, right? If he's Lord, he's the boss. He's the master. I can't be the master. You can only have one master, right? Am I missing something here? So if he says whatever, then I say, yes, sir. That's what Lord means. And then I believe that God raised him from the dead, which is obvious because if God didn't raise him from the dead, he can't even save himself, much less anybody else. So I have to believe that. I mean, I, I believe that. I, even when I was growing up and didn't know anything about God, I, 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 I believe that Jesus came like they said and he rose from the grave. I didn't have any reason not to believe it, even though I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't brought up in a Christian home, but I did believe that. So that's where we are. So I want you to just bow your head with me. Right now.